we give you a preview of the very near future and show you where you fit in. In a month from now, or even next week, you might be among those men, one of those combat bombardiers being briefed to blast the enemy. Later, outside, you'll be supervising the loading of your bombs and otherwise getting set for the target. But this is the point, the important point. Are you sure you'll be set for the target? Will you be able to do the job on the very first trip you make? That, in short, is your assignment, no matter where you are. Whether you take off from England in a B-26, or from the Solomons in the nose of a Mitchell. Your plane may be a Liberator, a Fortress, or a B-29. It doesn't matter which. For you all will be measured by one common rule, your knowledge of your trade, as it actually is. Here in authentic combat shots, you'll see all your training pay off. This is a look at the real thing. This is what it's like. And these are the tools you will use. Demolition bombs, for example. These happen to be 500 pounders, although, as you know, demos range in weight from 100 pounds to as much as six solid tons. When tactics require real destruction, through blast, fragmentation, or shock, these are the bombs you'll carry. And when fused for instantaneous explosion, that's the way they'll perform. But let's say you're coming in low, right over the target area. In that case, your bombs will be fused for delay. And as you see, you're safely clear of the area well before they explode. The type and character of the target, though, is always the governing factor. Not only as to the size of your bombs, but the fusing of them as well. Now watch. You're going to be using a lot of these. So take a good look now. They're frags, clusters of aimable fragmentation bombs. And if you didn't recognize them then, there'll be some more in a second. Here they come, a sky full of murder for personnel, motor transports, airplanes parked on the ground. They can be dropped singly, of course, but when you let go with a series of clusters like these, you really get maximum results. They're just beginning to burst now. But the real damage isn't visible from here. The frag, you see, breaks up into from 800 to 1,200 separate pieces, each one of them about the size of a caliber 30 bullet. And right now, from each one of those points of impact, those pieces are flying out as far as 600 yards, producing casualties as distant as 165 feet. Now, suppose you attach them to parachutes. Well, those are what you get, parafrags. Bombs which float slowly down upon aircraft, for example, in open dispersal and revetment. When equipped with chutes, an impact type of instantaneous fusing of the bomb nose is employed. Thus, the plane is well clear of the area at the instant of the blast. Thus, too, the bomb is vertical at the moment of impact, and the greatest and most uniform destructive effects are achieved. Here goes a bomb bay load of matches. Four pound matches, in fact. Yes, those are incendiary bombs, and when used in combination with frags, are often more damaging to an inflammable target than a huge concentration of demos. Witness this city in Germany, glowing now with hundreds of fires begun by incendiaries. This is target saturation by cluster after cluster of these bombs. Each cluster consists of 34 incendiaries, and each incendiary contains a thermite mixture that, when ignited, burns at 4,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That produces a flame. So do these gel bombs, 50-gallon gasoline drums filled with a gelatin-like gasoline mixture. The stuff flies out and adheres, flaming, to whatever surface it strikes. Recognize these? Exploded white phosphorus bombs. Incendiary particles of these 30-pounders arching out from the impact center are effective against personnel in open areas and trenches that could never be reached by GPs or frags. And here's another job they do a protective cover against ACAC, fused to explode from 50 to 100 feet above the ground, each bomb tosses out a mushroom of smoke over a 100-yard area, thus producing your screen. Speaking of smoke bombs, here's another type with quite a different use. Pathfinders, planted in the sky by that all-important key man of any mission, the lead bombardier. They're bomb release markers for the bombardiers who'll follow. As they dropped, 
These pathfinders released a chemical mixture which reacted with the moisture in the air to leave smoke trails approximately 10,000 feet long, extending, as you see, down toward the target. Ten minutes from now, they'll still be visible, and from 25 miles away. You'll be seeing a lot of these very soon. Yes, just as there are various types of equipment, there are various ways of using that equipment, various ways of getting those bombs to the specific targets for which they were built. For speed, for surprise, for clear visibility, and for eluding the enemy's radar, you want to come in at a low level. You want to sneak in over the target approach, hit fast and hard and sure. That A-20 shadow is on northern French soil during last summer's air offensive. These boys are headed for an industrial target, and this is the way they're going after it. But different targets call for different tactics. Thus, tactics are constantly changing. Yet one thing always is constant, the bombardier's bombing sense. Flying at low level or at medium height, the bombardier must have the same sure instinct for the job at hand. His powers of target identification, for example, must be developed to a high degree. His eye must be swift, his selection right. High-level missions put an extra premium on such a talent as that. They also make careful attention to your briefing an absolute necessity. You've got to know your target. You've got to know every pertinent fact about the mission you're on. For that isn't Wichita or Sacramento down there. That's an enemy town. And what a difference that makes. You'll encounter no flak over Kansas, like this that you see here. Odd little shapes, aren't they? But don't fool yourself. They're very definitely unfriendly. You'd better learn what you can about avoiding that stuff. Remember that evasive action involves two main principles. Let enemy gunners track your plane, thus predict your future course. Then make sure you change that course, that you're someplace else when that flak explodes. Fighters are something else, but just as unhealthy as flak. Remember that during your recognition course and when you're out on the gunnery range. Here's some captured Nazi film. Fortresses being attacked by German fighters. You get the point? When you're in the nose of one of those bombers, it's too late to be guessing about identification. Too late to learn how to shoot and so get your bombs to the target. For that is your primary job. You're not up there to seek Messerschmitts or go out scouting zeros. Your sole objective is to hit the target. Nothing else matters but that. You'll learn that the enemy will try every means to make your bombs go astray. He'll conceal his target, for example, with a smoke screen, just as you see here. But your briefing on that whole target area will enable you to pinpoint certain spots, positions on the edge of that screen. And with those positions as pointers, still nail the target within. You'll look out for these things, too. No, not a cloud, an aerial phosphorus bomb tossed by a Japanese plane. He'll dive toward your ship, pull up sharply, and pitch the bomb straight ahead. He's gone by the time it explodes. Object, bust up your formation, ignite your plane. But whatever the enemy throws against you, your determination will see you through. Your determination that nothing will ever deter you from delivering your bombs to the right target. Better take a look at some of those targets. See the kind of objectives you'll be hitting, like that a key Nazi roadway in Normandy, blasted by 500-pound GPs. Now watch. Here's how not to bomb a road junction. See those craters? They're misses. Means you've got to go back again. Back until you hit. Like that. And that. And that. Repeat missions cost time and expense and safety. Do your job on the very first trip you make. Take a look, for example, at the way these B-26s go after some railroad tracks. Now, that's what you call good bombing. And here's some more of the same. No, not those. Wait till we get past the smoke. Now, 500 pounders dropping in on important Nazi marshalling yards. Those are bombs dropping on German subpins by courtesy of some Dutch Air Force squadrons flying B-25s at medium altitude. Hits like those put an early end to Adolf's submarine threat. Now keep your eye on that larger ship, that one on the left. Bingo! And another, and another. But remember, that target was stationary. 
A moving ship taking evasive action is quite another matter. But there again, bombing sense will give you the answer to that. Her moves can be anticipated through a shrewd tactical consideration of that telltale wake you see. That's your lead, and there are your hits. Now take a lesson on how to put a Jap runway out of the war. Very handsome hem stitching, right up the line. Here's one for you. You want to make a railroad bridge inoperative without wrecking the bridge itself. There she is, and there's the hit. Expert bombing of a bridge approach. Now let's cruise up this river in Italy until we come to another bridge. It's mighty important to the Germans, who need it in their retreat north of Rome. This bridge you've got to destroy. And there she is. Okay with those bombs? There. Those are hits, right on the nose. Watch that railroad bridge, there on the upper left. Some hits, a miss, then nothing but hits. And Kesselring's boys in Italy were cut off from still more supplies. Forget the bridge there, wait for the one coming up. Yes, those craters you see all around it mean previous unsuccessful trips, but this ought to be the last. They've really got its number this time. Let's drop down for a look. This won't happen very often, once you're over there. You won't have much chance to get a close-up of the product of your work. We're going to make some exceptions to that. Here's a close-up of that Italian bridge you just bombed, with 500-pound GPs. Try to run a locomotive over that. For that matter, try to use these freight cars ever again. This is the way rail yards in Michinaw, Burma, looked after bombers the 10th Air Force got through. More rail damage, to tankers this time. The scene is Normandy. The time, last summer's invasion activities. The tactical result, further strangulation of the Nazis' fuel supply line. No, this isn't a stone quarry. This is saint Lo in France, after more than 3,000 bombardiers paid her a call. In the space of two and one half hours on the morning of July 25th, 1944, Heavy bombers dropped 6,000 tons of bombs into an area no more than two by 9,000 yards square. And that, gentlemen, is a bystander's view of a bomb crater. There are many of those, for this village was literally saturated with everything from 500-pound demos to 23-pound frags. Thus, air power erased a tactical barrier. Once part of a French automobile plant, the Nazis converted it to the manufacture of airplanes and trucks. Then American bombardiers converted it to scrap metal and rubble. Short delay fusing of heavy GPs was the secret of such effective destruction. The bombs penetrated the roof before they exploded, thus wrecked the machinery, and the foundation as well. Note the relatively untouched condition of the nearby houses, a testimony to pinpoint bombing. This isn't so bad either. Not a mark on that taxiway running directly past this row of battered Nazi airfield hangars in France. A tenth of a second delay fusing did the job. Know what those are, or rather used to be? Hangars for German dirigibles, later used as storage space for Nazi robot bombs, now reduced to useless bits of concrete by very thorough bombing. You remember the parachute fragmentation bombs in the early part of this film. Well, here's what they did once they landed. Japanese planes on Leahy Island, ripped, disemboweled, rendered useless by two types of parafrags. 100 pounders released singly, and smaller 3.23 pounders dropped in clusters. Clark Field on Luzon Island in the Philippines got just this kind of treatment. Planes knocked out, runways undamaged. A completely unserviceable airstrip on Japhel Wochi Island, thanks to 500 pound GPs. One of the two best shots of real craterization. Here's the other one. Craterization on a saturation scale. In the course of a light assault, this residential section of Michinaw, Burma, was converted by the Japs into defense installations. Each dwelling became a stronghold, and accordingly was blasted to bits. Roads were saved for our use. Michinaw fell. Our hooks went deeper into Burma. Good bombardering again paid off. Good bombardering always pays off, sometimes in rewards that are too vast to measure. Look below you. See those flashes? They're fire from 15-inch naval guns. Fire from the last of the great Nazi battleships, the Tirpitz, anchored in a Norwegian fjord. Watch. Watch those 12,000-pound bombs hit the deck. They're important hits. 
Not because flying at 16,000 feet, these Royal Air Force Lancasters performed a remarkable feat of bombing. They're important because they knocked out the one German vessel that for too long had menaced the Russian convoy route. And because as the Tirpitz keeled over for good, a great part of Allied strength was thus released from the North Atlantic to sail and fight in other waters. These planes too are making history. They're a long way from home right now, well over a thousand miles, flying low over country they've never seen before. Peaceful looking country with neat, well-tilled fields of wheat. And one of the world's greatest sources of fuel, fuel for Germany's war machine. This is the Ploesti oil field in Romania, and 165 liberators of the 15th Air Force are pushing their way through a hail of flak and through blinding smoke to drop bombs from oil derrick level. These bombardiers released 147 1,000 pounders, and almost twice that many 500 pounders. They were just as generous with the incendiaries, for nothing burns so well as oil and gas. Yes, fuel that was destined for German tanks, for fighters, for submarines, is here going up in black smoke. For all practical purposes, Ploesti was killed, and one-third of the Wehrmacht's oil needs forever lost to her. A crippling blow to the Nazi, and warning also to the Jap. Warning that despite all opposition, our bombardiers will get through to his target, hit it, and cancel that out. There will be other Ploesties in the months to come, Ploesties that you'll wipe out. And when you make your bomb runs over those targets, you'll be in complete command. Then it will be more than your ship and your mission. At that moment, it will be your war. <laughs>